the scheduled November Board of Education meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Please silence your cell phone if you have not done so already and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> all right, thank you. Secretary Hatfield, will you take roll, please? Yes, I will. Uh, roll call. President McFarland is not here. Vice President Rausch? Here. Secretary Hatfield is here. Treasurer Lauterbach? Here. Member Baker? Here. Member Blasey? Here. Member Frazee? Uh, he's not here. All right, you're all set. All right, thanks. So moving into the consent agenda, item 2.1, approval of the October 25th, 2021 regular meeting minutes. Item 2.2, 2, um, the following staff have announced their resignation on the effective dates listed in the agenda. And then item 2.3, approval of the payment of the school system's bills for September is listed in the check register prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of nine million. $580,928 is recommended. Distribution of the funds is included in this document. So motion to approve the, like to hear a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. <coughs> member Lauterbach and member Hatfield. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. All right, <clears throat> moving on to Superintendent Sherrill's Shining Stars, item number 3.1. So our first <clears throat> uh, Shining Star tonight is not with us, uh, but Mr. McFarland and I paid a visit to him and presented him this award. You may have saw the Midland Daily News. He was recognized as uh, one of our long-term crossing guards for the school district. They're actually city employees, but uh, we'd like to recognize him. He's a pretty special guy when you get to meet him. So Mr. Suppinger is his name. Charles was a teenager. When Charles was a teenager, his father, Cletus Suppinger, served as a member of the Board of Education for eight years, 1944 to 1952. Charles graduated from Midland High in 1952, following three years in the Army and a successful 35-year career at Dow Chemical. Mr. Suppinger dedicated 20 years to keeping Midland Public Schools students safe on their way to and from school as a crossing guard in the corners of Jefferson and Sugnet in Washington and Sugnet before he retired at the end of the 2021 school year. <coughs> the old adage of the U.S. Postal Service is so true also for our dedicated crossing guards. In either rain or snow or heat or gloom of the night days, these countries from the swift com completion of their appointed rounds. When we are driving by the crossing guard corners in our nice warm vehicles before or after school, in a day and day out, the dedicated public servants are keeping our students safe as they cross the street in frigid temps, rain, snow, sleet, heavy traffic, slippery streets and sidewalks. Thank you, Charles, for your 20 years of dedicated service, keeping our students physically safe and making their day just a little bit brighter by greeting them with a smile and an encouraging word each day. Congratulations, Dr. Charles. And I'm hoping our second awardee is here, uh, Farah, if you are, come on up. And Farah, if I say your last name, correct me, okay? You can come on up while I'm saying all kinds of good things about you. How's that? <laughs> so uh, hopefully I get Sarah's last name right. Ms. Murgis joined the NPS team in 2011 as the speech language pathologist in the Special Services Department. Before coming to NPS, Farah was a speech language pathologist at the Bay Aaronic ISD in the hospital settings before that. Farah earned her master's degree in speech and language pathology in 2000 and her BAA in communication disorders in 1998. Both degrees were earned at Central Michigan University. Farah was nominated by the Shining Star by NPS Parent. Among their comments were the following. Farah always has a positive professional attitude. She really invests in her students. She has been so encouraging to our daughter in our meetings. Our daughter's weaknesses are always met with understanding an understanding heart, kindness, and a motivational mindset that keeps her excited to work with Farah. Her bright spirit and determination 
are such a blessing. Her students' progress is, uh, progress is always celebrated, and she's consistently ready to give her all in this role for the success of her students. Congratulations, Farrah. Shining Stars, uh, Superintendent Shero, item 3.2. Yes, <clears throat> so we are recommending to the board to approve an athletic eligibility uh, appeal. We had a subcommittee of board members who met on this subject matter, and um, under Rule 9 of the Michigan High School Athletic Association, which we are a member of, um, we have the ability to approve the student's eligibility. And we are approving this, or asking for the recommendation, recommendation to approve his eligibility at Midland High School for the fall semester. Entertain a motion to approve item 3.2. Uh, I move that student A be approved for athletic eligibility at Midland High School per exception 9 of section 9 from, uh, for the, uh, or from the 2021-2022 MHSAA handbook. Support. Any discussion? Okay, everybody in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries 5 0. <clears throat> All right, at this time, move to item 4, which is request to address the board. Again, this is a time for us to listen to the public, take your input, which is an important part of the school district. Um, please be respectful in your comments. We're here to listen. We will follow up with you afterwards if need be. And with that, um, Jillian Smith is the first on my list. Welcome. Hi, my name is Jillian Smith and I'm an eighth grade student at Jefferson Middle School. When our teachers first told us that we weren't allowed to watch CNN 10, we were just confused and we didn't really have an explanation. To be honest, we were kind of kept in the dark about it. When we asked our teachers why we weren't being shown this beloved show anymore, they just said that they didn't have any information about it. It was revealed later that it was because of our age. The rule is, in my opinion, absolutely absurd. The case you're making only applies to CNN 10's interactive areas of the site. And may I point out, we can't access those areas. This is a show that has been loved by students of MPS for years. And just like that, with little explanation, it's gone. Why are you choosing to address this issue now rather than in the past when it could have been brought up much earlier, if it's even an issue at all? Um, and not only am I an eighth grade student, but I'm also the editor-in-chief of the Husky Times, the Jefferson School newspaper, and um, therefore, I mean, the news is more important to me than any aspect of the school. And now that CNN 10 is gone, it just, the students have no other way to get their news, and they are kind of uninformed, honestly, about the events going on in the world around them. And you might think that the students don't care or that they have no opinion about the issues, but they do. I did a little research about uh, the student body opinion, and I took a random survey across all the grades. And over 92% of the 112 students surveyed are unhappy about the banning of this show. I, so I ask once more, please take a little more thought into this decision before you make a final decision. Thank you. Next, Melissa Buschek. Hi, I'm here again. My name is Melissa Buschek. I'm a mother of three, coming back out to share my concerns for my children as well as other parents I know who aren't able to make it or don't feel comfortable speaking up here. When I call, your staff didn't even need help spelling my last name. I'm gonna assume that's a good thing. I'll quickly recap my history. Um, in September, I spoke to you about the 
mask you're asking the K through six uh, grade students to wear all day and provide how they and provided that they how they all have warnings stating in fact that they don't provide protection from COVID or any other virus and since that is still gone um, unaddressed it's I would consider that undisputed by anyone in this room I haven't still been given an explanation um, then in October I came back to address um, my concern for the continuing to extend this mask mandate at the hands of Mike Shero um, and several um, other pop public commenters in the room called on this elected board to vote on this matter um, I know after the meet uh, at the end of the meeting um, you all, well, those that spoke, addressed support for Cheryl's decision. So I'm going to assume that's an unofficial vote to give one person control. Um, even though I don't believe or agree with the expertise um, for making that decision, um, I don't agree with the supporting, the supporting science doesn't show it. And how does how does the background of a superintendent give you capacity to decide such matters unilaterally and universally for all of the students um, there's no health department requirement on our students for masks and mandates aren't laws and i reject your attempt to turn our schools into medical facilities since i demonstrated last time that you failed to work cooperatively with concerned parents by having them rise up out of their seats in agreement I have a couple questions for the audience tonight. Members of the audience, I ask that you rise up out of your seats if you answer yes to the following questions. First, do you reject giving away your children's medical freedoms to this superintendent and elected school board? Thank you. I don't, I don't think that's how this works. Second, do you reject the notion that this school board has your child's health as top priority when they accept federal and state funds to hold vaccination clinics inside our schools? Third, do you reject the fact that this board of education holds no accountability for their actions because they claim the health department and CDC told them to abuse our children? All right. under the false Thanks, Ms. Bouchek. Thank you for addressing the board. <laughs> Christy Murray. Hi, thanks for having me. In the interest of time, I'll, um, I'm going to read part of a letter that I wrote provided to our state school board last month. Um, I can't, I won't have time to read it all, so I'm only going to read certain parts. I'm a longtime resident of Midland, Michigan, and a concerned mother of two young boys. Parents are desperate for help against these blanket COVID policies that are difficult to fight against. Currently, my son is forced to wear a mask eight hours a day in school, and it has a negative impact on him. Parents in our district have bagged our board for the right to choose what is best for our children based on their individual needs. And I spoke Monday, this is last month, hopefully you remember, to our school board stating that I know what's best for my child. Um, and then um, a concerned parent had emailed the superintendent about what I wrote, and he was quoted to say, um, a local paratus as educators have the right to act as parents when controlling students, and concomitantly they have the duty to act like a parent when protecting students from foreseeable harm. School officials not only act like parents, they also have responsibilities that parents do not have, end quote. This is extremely concerning to me as a parent. I believe that our superintendent is abusing this law to override my parental authority. These are my children that I've entrusted to provide to him to provide a safe environment, but I do not expect him to override my parental rights. I have a bachelor's in education from CMU and a master's in product stewardship from the School of Public Health from IUPUI. I've worked in the health and safety field for close to 15 years, and I have knowledge in areas such as child development, industrial hygiene, um, personal protective equipment, and uh, the most important credential I hold is mother. I am far more suited to decide what is best for my children than the local school board, especially when it comes to medical decisions and masking is a medical decision. We parents are aware that the board has stated that masking will become optional after December 13th. 
However, that doesn't stop the board, um, specifically our superintendent, from deciding that it is his or your duty to override my authority on my children. This policy, which is the policy in which masking mandates are forced upon our children, needs to be removed from Midland Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Sherry Trent. Hi, all of you. <clears throat> um, I'm here to speak today on, um, on an issue that's really dear to, I think, all the parents in this room. And we, um, the issue is we want our school boards to represent the desires of Midland parents. And we don't feel that's always happening. Um, it's been stated by several members of the school board and Mr. Sharo um, that you follow the Michigan Association of School Boards policies and guidelines. Just for some history on whom this organization really is, from their website, it's a voluntary <laughs> nonprofit association of local and intermediate school boards located throughout the state of Michigan and um, membership in that represents nearly all public school districts in the state. <clears throat> Today, MASB is recognized as a major voice influencing education issues at the state level. This is on their website. Through its federation with the National School Board Association, MASB and its members also have an impact at the national level. And their mission is, is sounds great, it's to provide high quality education leadership services to all Michigan boards of education and advocate for equitable and exceptional public education for all students. And it sounds like what we think our elected officials at the Michigan Department of Education are doing, but they've delegated this to the MASB. And I remind you that the National School Board Association, who many states are disassociating with at this time because they want parents labeled as domestic terrorists. Um, so MASB has nothing to do with the Michigan Board of Education, which is an elected body. Um, in fact, they collect two and a half million dollars in dues every year, and represent almost every school board in the state. They also receive 700,000 in conference and seminar fees. They create policy drafts, and they give advice, advice to our school board. They're not elected, yet they seem to have authority over the parents on how elected officials do business. Our tax dollars go to this organization so they can give guidance and create policy drafts against the parents and community, all in the name of caring for children. The Michigan Department of Education deems school districts to be autonomous and therefore encourages the school boards to become members of this nonprofit, MASB. Well, our elected officials have been commanded by organizations like MASB while we were too busy to even notice. It's time for all parents to speak up and take notice of what's really going on behind the scenes and has been for decades. We've had our voices stolen. How are you as elected officials agreeing to follow their policies and ignoring the voices of the parents and the community? You need to serve this community and the interests that are voiced in these meetings by listening to the people that care, you know, um, and about the children. Thank you, Ms. Trent. Joe Bonadies. <clears throat> Greetings. My name is Joe Bonadies. I attended my first school board meeting last month and had several surprises. But under your new, as yet unapproved bylaws of three minutes, I will cover only one. It was a quick item of two maintenance vans which were going to be purchased in Owasso. To be clear, I have no problem with replacing old equipment. I worked factory maintenance and knew that you need good tools to keep the wheels on the machine, but I was concerned that the board was going to send taxpayer dollars so far away from the Tri-City area. Did you get multiple bids, who decided, et cetera? After seeing the detailed agenda later on, I saw the full entry and the contract numbers. I looked up the process and saw that the state has a plug and play contracting system, which makes the choice of Owasso basically unavoidable. I later saw a copy of the Finance Facilities and Operations Subcommittee minutes, a sub-team meeting which is allegedly not subject to the Open Meeting Act and should be run under Robert's Rules of Order, had the following minimalist line, entry four. 
Maintenance van purchase. Administration will propose the purchase of two cargo vans to be utilized by the maintenance department. The cost of the vans is built into the 21-22 general fund budget. Okay, proposal was made. The subcommittee must have accepted the proposal because it made the October agenda. Your bylaws, number 0155, on committee, section F says, if appropriate, following the study of a given topic, the designated administrator or superintendent will prepare an action item for the Board of Education agenda in cooperation with the president of the board. If the committee recommendation has been formulated, it is that recommendation which will be considered. If rejected, the committee will restudy the, uh, restudy the recommendation to determine what else should be done. So this subcommittee, which only gathers information can formulate a recommendation or can reject a recommendation. How can you say they are not making decisions? Per the Open Meeting Act, a quote, decision, unquote, means a determination, action, vote, or disposition upon a motion, proposal, recommendation, resolution, and a bunch of other stuff, uh, on which a vote by members of the public board is required and by which a public board effectuates or formulates public policy. This board's mo mode of action fits the definition of obfuscation to render obscure, unclear, and unintelligible. I'm sure that the training you received from the MASB is fully aligned with making this superintendent-driven system with a spectator board, but I don't really think that is what you were all elected to do, and the parents are not domestic terrorists, as suggested by the National School Board Association and the U.S. Attorney General for shining a little light into the abyss. The last thing is that Mr. Sherrow mentioned at the last meeting that there were three groups he was hearing from, pro-mask and anti-mask. He never identified the third group, and inquiries to one board member indicated that they didn't appear to know who the third group was either. So I'd like to find out later on who the third group is. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Bonadies. Renita Bonadies. Hello again, my name is Renita. As I mentioned at the last meeting, the bylaws state, each statement made by a participant, participant shall be limited to five minutes duration. Again, you violated the bylaws by reducing minutes into three minutes. Um, instead of complying anything, you've doubled down by putting new things on the agenda, like redefining the request to address the board item with no public discussion or vote by the board. That is not how rules you are governed by work. I left a message about any of the four study committee meetings being open to the general public. Megan called back and said that they are for information gathering only and no voting or decision making takes place, so therefore they do not fall under the Open Meeting Act. As noted earlier by my husband, there are obviously decisions under the definition of o OMA taking place. The public has vested interest in understanding and seeing this process of decision making by this board as it is not carried out on all topics at the monthly meetings. The board also went from twice a month meetings to once a month in January of 2014 after Mr. Sharrow was hired. The further lack of transparency in doing business in public was not the intent of the Open Meeting Act. At the October 25th meeting, Mr. Sharrow stated, and I quote, the law says I need to keep kids protected. It says I must as the superintendent, and I signed an oath to that. This is actually not true, Mr. Sharrow, and has been verified with an email from Cindy. I asked for a copy of your oath of office. Her response, Mr. Sharrow is not an elected official, so he does not hold an office and therefore does not take an oath of office. Only you as elected board members take an oath of office. Is this how Mr. Sharrow tries to imply more authority and commitment to these children than he really has? We also learned from Linda that you have been given special board member training from the MASB. You are trained on how to sure, be sure your employee, Mr. Sharrow, isn't made to look bad at public meetings. You have to spoon feed him questions ahead of time so he is never put on the spot at these meetings. I would remind you as elected officials hired by We the People that you took an oath to the Constitution in answer to us. Mr. Sharrow is your employee, not your boss. You can show respect, but you are to hold him accountable to what he proposes and the decisions he is making for this district. 
You are not to just be yes men and women. If you find your task too difficult or are afraid to ask the tough questions, including holding Mr. Sharo accountable, then you need to resign now. There are others ready and able to serve this community in your place. Thank you, Ms. Bonadies. <coughs> Kata Lena? Hello, and thank you for your time. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Now, who said that? President Franklin Roosevelt. Is a life lived in constant fear worth living? If we are so afraid of an invisible germ, enough to wear a useless mask and jab our arms with an experimental vaccine, what have we become? If we can't even hug a child for fear of getting COVID, we have truly entered the twilight zone. Even Rod Serling couldn't have written such an unbelievable script. We hear over and over again, get the vaccine. Now they are aiming for the vaccination of millions of young children. Even though experts have known for a long time that children suffer very little risk from the COVID-19 virus. Children have innate immunity, which is strong and works to guard them against the virus. There is no need to give the experimental shot to children or young teenagers. They have an almost 0% chance of harm after getting the virus. And certainly mandating people to take the shot is not the right thing to do. Besides being unconstitutional, forcing individuals to take the shot to be able to work or to attend school is severely harming the population. Many vaccinated people are experiencing heart problems and blood clots. Famous sports figures, including soccer players, are collapsing on the field. High school boys are dropping to the ground during games. If you doubt these stories, do your own research. Look up Jacob Kleinick, a 13-year-old boy from Zilwaukee, Michigan. He died in his sleep after receiving the vaccine. Go to the VAERS, which is V-A-E-R-S, website to see how many adverse health events have been posted. The deaths from the vaccines have now reached over 18,000 people, with thousands more completely disabled after taking the shot. Remember that the VAERS reporting system may only represent about 1% of the adverse health events, according to the FDA and CDC themselves. The death totals are probably much, much higher. Dr. Eric Rubin, voting member on the FDA advisory panel, said of the shot for children, we're never going to learn about how safe the vaccine is unless we start giving it. That's just the way it goes. Do you really want your children to be Dr. Rubin's guinea pig? Thank you for your time. Will Zablocki. Hi there, thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm usually here to talk about the masks, but tonight I'm not here to talk about the masks actually. Um, I'm here to raise awareness of an issue that's affecting co-parents in this community, um, specifically regarding children's vaccinations. Um, on November 4th, the communique went out to, uh, in the morning about MPS hosting vaccination clinics almost immediately after, after the emergency use authorization was made, uh, allowing children between 5 and 11 to become vaccinated. Um, the basis for this was a study um, involving approximately 3,000 children. Um, out of all the children in the country, there were about 3,000 that participated in the study. That alone is statistically insignificant. I'm smart enough to acknowledge that. Um, out of all the, uh, so rightfully, I wanted my children to wait to be vaccinated until I saw, you know, other people getting vaccinated and had the opportunity to determine if it was safe or not for my children. Um, and, and just to be clear, um, there are a lot of adverse event reports, um, and I see that. Um, I'm also vaccinated, so I'm not, um, you know, an anti-vaxxer, um, as I might get labeled sometimes. 
Um, so here is the problem with that. I came down and I spoke with Mr. Sharo and he told me that you guys are just sites for the vaccination clinics and that you won't relay my non-consent for the vaccination within your facilities and that I have to go to the court. Um, so I, I went to the health department and I, Fred Yanoski wasn't available to meet me, but he did call me back. Um, he called me back and he told me that I need to go to the courts and that they don't have the resources to track a non-consent list at the sites and that I need to go to the courts. So um, both of the two parties, Mr. Shar and Mr. Yanoski, agreed that um, only one parent signature is required regardless of court order. Um, and this is a medical decision, and this is a 40-second circuit court order that I will read the important parts from right now. On July 16, 2021, an order was entered providing for the parties are awarded joint legal and joint physical custody of the minor children. A uh, written complaint was filed with the friend of the court alleging that ex-spouse violated the order by insisting that my children become vaccinated anyway. And so this is a show cause hearing for violating that order. And my concern is that it's, this, it's not just this, okay? The school has disregarded my rights as a parent in multiple other ways. Um, for example, this in individual reading improvement plan, um, I'm fully on board with my son. It, you know, if he has a hard time uh, with uh, speaking sounds, words, uh, letter sounds, he should do this, absolutely. What I don't agree with is finding out after the fact and not being informed. And, and this decision happened within a week. Thank you. Jake Lewis. All right, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jacob Lewis. I'm a father of five, uh, four of which that go to MPS. I want to start by saying thank you for the recent decision to lift the mandate on K through, K through 6, December 15th. Um, although I do not agree with it being enforced at all, I do appreciate the decision to lift it. So I hope that continues to be the plan. Um, I do have some issues that I would like to address that are concerning in regards to the mask mandate practices and rapid testing procedure, however. Two weeks ago, my first grader had to quarantine due to a close contact. In order to go back to school, she had to take a rapid test in the office. As I walked her through the office, there was a line of kids who were waiting for N95 masks because they did not bring one from home. While the secretary in the office was handing each kid an N95 mask, she said to them in a stern voice, quote, you kids really need to bring your own mask. We don't have enough to keep giving you new ones every day so at the end of the day put them in your backpack and bring them to school this week end quote that's concerning to me because first of all I've seen the amount of money that Midland Public Schools gets for COVID relief which includes funding for medical supplies ie masks so in my opinion if Midland Public Schools is going to mandate medical equipment to be worn by the students in order to attend the classes while MPS gets millions of dollars in relief from the state and federal government MPS should absolutely be able to provide a new mask for each child every single day or more because according to the CDC decontamination and reuse of N95 respirators, quote, the number of times that an FFR can be, can be reused is limited by fit, filtration performance, contamination and soiling, and damage. If these N95 masks are touched by your fingers, their effectiveness is significantly decreased by soiling. Have you looked inside a six-year-old's mask after a day of use? So please explain to me why MPS staff is reprimanding children for not bringing their own masks to school and telling them to put them in their backpacks because they don't have enough to provide for them. It's no wonder why hand, foot, and mouth RSV cases are at, are at some of the highest levels on record in school-age children. On the same day, to my surprise, the principal who, to my understanding, does not have a medical have any medical training, administered a rapid COVID test on my daughter, on my first grader, without any gloves or washing of hands first, which is very basic sanitation protocol when administering these tests. With absolutely zero symptoms, my six year old daughter in first grade was told she was positive for COVID according to the rapid test and she was to stay home for another 10 day quarantine because of policy. My first grader was, has now missed 20 days of school because of these policies. She has had zero signs or symptoms of COVID contamination to date. My 12 year old at Northeast had to take a rapid test to be able to attend school after being close contacted. The school allowed him to administer the test on himself without washing his hands or wearing medical gloves, but they were very concerned he did not have a mask when he walked through the door. 
He had zero. He's had zero symptoms uh, uh, and has been out of school for 14 days this year so far uh, because of policy. So my question to the board, to the superintendent, Charo, and to the parents of the MPS is this. Why are our kids being reprimanded for not bringing masks? Why are they being told by staff that the school cannot provide masks for them to get when MPS Thanks, gets Jay. millions of dollars from COVID relief from the federal government? Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Why Thank are you. schools All right, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I got it. Thank you. And you're breaking the law by not following five minutes. We're asking you and we're coming for three spots in November. Amanda Andrus. Thank you. Tough act to follow this evening. Um, <laughs> but I have just a few points I'd like to make with you all, um, so I appreciate the time to speak. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, you guys, I think you're, you're trying to do, you know, the best that, that you can as, as you see it. However, I, personally, I'm fed up with this, with the masking. Um, and my child will not be sent to school with a mask after December 13th. And I also just wanted to say that, um, you know, that, that um, accountability needs to occur with the board members um, for the actions of the superintendent and the decisions that are made. Um, I don't feel that you should push your responsibilities off on, on, on the superintendent to make. Um, you need to make, help make your own decisions. You represent us. You are elected by, um, by the taxpayers and by the parents to, to help make these decisions for our kids and the schools, and you shouldn't be pushing your authority off to um, one individual. Um, I also just wanted to make a, just a comment. I, I'm in the community quite a bit. I see, you know, board members um, with that have kids that have agreed with the the masking um, as as um, communicated through the superintendent. But when the, when people are out in the community, they don't necessarily follow those same policies. So why is it, you know, something you know magical between you know um, 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. that that's when COVID is a problem, but for sports and for concerts and school gatherings afterwards, no one's wearing a mask. I mean, come on. Um, so, you know, uh, just asking for a little consistency and a little practicality here. You know, if they work, if masks work so well, then, then why not? Why not? Why aren't the people being leaders and showing that same behavior out in, in the community? Um, and obviously, right, the rest of the community does not have to wear a mask. Why are we punishing our children for this? These are, this, is, this is my parental right to make this sort of decision for my child. Um, and so uh, that's pretty much it for that. I did also want to just say um, this week, uh, Representative Ann Bolin from Brighton um, signed a letter along with 35 other state representatives to the Michigan Association of School Boards asking um, them to withdraw from the National School Board Association um, for labeling parents, concerned parents, as domestic terrorists. And I just wanted to point that out, that I support that, and that I hope that, you know, um, people are considering that more because that many states have done that, and I believe that Michigan should follow. Thank you. Hi there. I'm guessing I'm the only one in this room who has actually been in a negative air pressure isolation room in full PPE, no. caring for a person with a deadly infectious respiratory disease. RN, for nearly 40 years, three states, currently retired. All opinions do not hold the same value. It is dismaying that those making decisions in our community, school district, fail to understand that there are informed and uninformed opinions. All opinions do not have the same degree of validity, reliability, or credibility. I've communicated in the past encouraging the school district to implement universal masking, recommended by a variety of health professionals, organizations with expertise in infectious disease and public health mitigation measures. 
my last communication warned of where our hospitals would be with COVID-19 patients increasing beyond 10% of the census and schools incubating the virus for community spread. That day has come and anyone paying attention with intact cognition knew it was coming. Sadly, no universal masking recommendation in the school district was implemented. The CDC, MCDPH, MDHHS, American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Medical Association, and the Infectious Disease Society of America were ignored by you. Instead, car seat manufacturers, landscapers, and those working with silicone were the resources, along with political pundits spewing poppycock. There was an occasional outlier in the medical field, misrepresenting the significance of one or two studies, or discounting the value of surgical masks when those who are immunocompromised or providing care to cancer patients in hospitals use them. So here we are, making the national news again. The schools are the source of the most outbreaks in our state. <laughs> Michigan leads the nation of COVID cases as we go into winter. Area hospitals are diverting patients to other locations. In fact, the Michigan hospital situation made the New York Times with our neighbor, Mid Michigan Medical Center in Alba, being on the cover. Thank you, Ms. Franzen. <laughs> Becky Thomas King. Hello, my name is Becky Thomas King, and I have been lucky enough to teach English at Midland High for 22 years. The last time I spoke before you two years ago, it was in regards to getting more voices of color into our literature that we teach. I'm happy to report that the teachers have continued through this process in addition to all their teaching duties, and we now have more diverse titles to share with our students. We advocate for our students. That is what we do as teachers. But tonight, I'm here to advocate for my friends and colleagues who are under attack under attack for teaching the district approved curriculum and for trying to teach students to be open-minded and critical thinkers. Over the last two months, I've received two emails from former chemics who have gone off to do great things in the world. They are critical thinkers who value varying perspectives. One is studying in London and the other just a few days ago presented her graduate paper at a national conference. As a teacher, there's nothing better than getting those emails. But also over the last month, I've seen fellow teachers attacked by name on social media, named publicly here at a board meeting, had resources pulled from their curriculum without discussion or replacement. And tonight, you accepted the resignation of an incredible Dow High English teacher. She can't easily be replaced. I've heard rumors of multiple MPS teachers looking for jobs outside the profession. And one of the worst things that can happen is when a great employee doesn't care anymore because they don't feel supported by the district or the surrounding community. We have great teachers here in the district. We need to keep them here. When I first started, if there was a concern about something that I was teaching, my administrator would set up a meeting about it with the parents. And it was horribly awkward, but it was a great learning experience for all sides involved to have the dialogue and to see other people's perspectives. We have taught To Kill a Mockingbird, Martin Luther King, Harlem Renaissance. We've taught these for decades, but now teachers are being harassed and bullied for doing so. How long before they stop caring? If so much of what goes on in their classrooms is under attack, teachers will stop caring and redirect their energies elsewhere. Sadly, maybe some have done so already. My students and I have discussed controversial topics in literature this year, and they have done so with grace, maturity, and respect, even when they disagreed with their fellow classmates. I'm really lucky to have the incredible students that I do. But in the back of my mind, 
I worry about when my name is going to be dragged through the mud. If what I do today in class or standing in front of all of you speaking will make me a target and the anxiety that will cause me and my family. This job is hard enough without having to worry all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. King. Wendy Brand. Dear elected members of the board, first let me start out by saying we are for you, not against you. You were elected because people trusted you to abide by the oath that you took and to best serve, protect, and educate our children. Unfortunately, it appears that most of you haven't been able to live up to the challenges of this position. Quote, overreaching bureaucrats are the biggest threat to our health in this time, Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. We are here tonight because we are standing up for those who cannot stand for themselves. Some people are angry because they fear what, they have, what you have done and are doing to our children, whether intentional or not. But in our spirits, we know that fear is from the devil and we will not honor him ever. We have faith that either you will do the right thing or stop, and stop this madness, or that you will do the right thing and stop this madness. Your overreach must end. And as for now, we instruct you to, take, to uh, set these captives free and let his people go. Speaking of the children, remove these mandates tonight and do what you know is right in your hearts. Never again speaking of injecting these innocent and healthy children with these experimental gene therapies that can cause death and have no verifiable evidence to prove the risk is greater than the reward. If, you, if your push to live in a socialist country is important to you, then we invite you to leave America and to go to Venezuela and let us know how that works out for you. However, we the people of this great nation will not allow you, yes you, to destroy its foundation. We order you to submit your resignations or comply with our instructions. <coughs> Excuse me. These are your two choices. You decide. Either way, we will continue to fight for our God-given liberties that are the foundation of the Constitution by, with, by which you took an oath to uphold yet have rejected. Friends and neighbors, do not for one minute or any longer allow these wolves in sheep clothing to pull the wool over your eyes. Stand up for your children, stand up for your liberties, and stand up for what God has blessed this great nation with, the Constitution of the United States for America. On another note, the board is exercising taxation without representation. Your tax dollar, um, dollars fund these schools, not the government. And they say you don't have the right to know or direct what's, t what's taught. Um, however, you pay the bills here, and you can uh, choose how the funds are used, not the elected bureaucrats who have secret illegal meetings. Perhaps withholding these funds and opening an escrow account is next. Board, um, your route is suicidal in my opinion and the destruction of democracy will not be tolerated. You do not get to suspend the parents' rights, the Bill of Rights, or the Constitution. So I ask you, why cheat if truth is on your side? Parents, a mass exodus may, be, may very well be the safest place for your children until the board decides to follow the law and their own bylaws. Thank you and God bless. Ted Kruger. Oh. All right. The mask policy must go. This PO 8450 period 01 mask policy was implemented as an emergency measure at the height of a pandemic to respond to and mitigate community spread of COVID-19. But the emergency is now gone. And so this emergency policy should likewise be gone. Here are three reasons the mask policy should go. Number one, the mask policy must go because it is no longer justified. As stated previously, the emergency phase of the COVID-19 COVID has passed. SARS-CoV-2 is no longer novel and has forever joined the pantheon of humanity's <coughs> seasonal ailments. We must pursue a return to normalcy. Number two, 
The mask policy must go because it appears that none of your constituents want it. It was unpopular months earlier when the mask mandate was first enacted. It is unpopular now. The mask mandate is being rescinded. Honestly and respectfully, it seems the only need this policy now meets is that of the boards, where they don't have to make the diff difficult decision and it is left up instead to the superintendent. And finally, most importantly, number three, the mask policy must go because it can now and in the future or in the future allow state bureaucrats to call the shots. This may not be written explicitly in the policy, but it is there between the lines. So here's my request. Please add a vote to next meeting's agenda to rescind the current unjustified and unpo unpopular mask, ma mask policy. Thank you. My name is Matt Buczek, a Midland public uh, school parent, healthcare hero, and proud American citizen. For some, first, some local statistics. We have about 34 inpatients at the Midland Hospital with a COVID primary. Four are under 50, and none under the age of 30. This number has been pretty steady all of November. We we're up to double that in October. So whatever, you're, whatever you've been told that doesn't match that, you've been lied to. Most COVID inpatients are not vaccinated, or I'm sorry, yes, most COVID inpatients are not vaccinated. The majority have other comorbidities, but the vast majority are also over 70. For Midland County, the freely accessible state data shows that we still have zero to five deaths for individuals under 50 years of age since COVID data has been tracked. Zero to five because the state doesn't report deaths less than five in any category to protect individuals' personal information. This statistic may have come to a shock to some of you, but here we are. I'd like to talk to you about something called number needed to vaccinate. In order to prevent one COVID death for five to 11 year olds, how many do we need to vaccinate? I think this is an important number because it tells us how we are effectively saving lives by vaccinating. <coughs> for example, Pfizer's six months clinical trial for their approval in adults, there was one COVID death out of 22,000 in the vaccine treatment group and two COVID deaths out of 22,000 in the placebo group. So the NNTV or the need to vaccinate is equal to 22,000 individuals to get that one saved life. The catch here was that in the trial, there were five heart attack deaths in the vaccine group and only one in the placebo group. All, co all cause mortality in the six month study was 20 in the vaccine group and 14 in the placebo group. Either the vaccine caused more deaths or it's just insignificant data. I don't care which side you take. But you can see why people believe Pfizer may have intentionally used a small group of 2,300 participants, one-tenth for the trial for the five to 11 year olds in order to hide the harm. Follow-up was also only done for two months instead of six months and the adult trial was supposed to go longer <clears throat> than even that. By Pfizer's own admission for their five to 11 year olds, emergency use authorization application, there were zero hospitalization, hospitalization, zero ICU emissions or deaths, the treatment or control group in either the treatment or the control group in their study. Children ages five to 11 are extremely low risk from death for coronavirus. In a meta-analysis combining data from five studies, a median infection fatality rate, that's the percent who die after infected, is 0.0027% for children ages zero to 19. In children ages five to 11, the IFR is even lower. Depending on the study one looks at, COVID-19 is less dangerous or roughly equivalent to the flu in children. Thanks, Mr. Bouchet. <laughs> Jen Ringle. Good evening. I believe deeply in freedom and choice. We are some of the luckiest people in the world to live in a country that protects the rights of most people. 
At board meetings for the past six months, we've had a constant stream of people exercising their right to free speech. Many of those asking to be free to make choices for individual kids without restrictions and asking for this board to stop restricting freedoms by enforcing rules they don't like. Choice and freedom are so important, but without rules, enforcement, and respect for others, absolute freedom of individual choice is actually the definition of anarchy. Tomorrow, if teachers told students to go home and do whatever they wanted, to be free to make their own choices without restrictions, regardless of the rules at home, this board would experience unprecedented parent engagement. And yet, that's what's happening in our classrooms right now. Students being allowed to think that the rules don't apply to them, the safety of others is less important than what they or their families want coupled with administrators who don't care to enforce the rules or support teachers, and it's basically anarchy. Every freedom granted to us by the Constitution has limits. And in those, in general, those limits of personal freedom extend until harm is caused to another. My child has a teacher who taught for two days unmasked and visibly ill before sharing they had COVID and all of my children sit in classrooms with close contacted students every day who refuse to mask. We've been in school for 91 days and 30% of total COVID deaths in 21 months have happened in the last 60. As of today, Midland Hospital has 61 COVID patients, 11 in ICU. The inaction of this school board is causing harm. Your students and staff, our school outbreaks are connected to the wider community. Your practices since the beginning of the year are causing severe burnout in your staff and are not working to prevent the spread of COVID in Midland. In the absence of anything but an advisory from the state with county commissioners who have a blatant disregard for public health and a health department whose hands are tied, this unfortunately falls to you to protect our kids and our community. So I offer you a suggestion tonight that puts a requirement for masking back in the hands of the community of everyone in this room. Let our collective actions speak louder than voices demanding freedom. Use a metrics-based policy, which will be tied to the choices of the community. If community spread is greater than 30 cases per 100,000 and positivity rate is greater than 5%, all will mask in schools. If we drop below those metrics, no masks. Let the freedom of our children to not wear masks be directly dependent on the choices that we all make together. Thank you, Mr. Ringgold. <laughs> Kurt Boheis. <laughs> Kurt Boheis. All right, thank you. So my name is Kurt Boheist. I'm a Midland resident, but the child enrolled in elementary school in the district. I'd like to make two points this evening regarding the mask mandate and this Board of Education. First, with the vaccine now available for K-6 K through six children, PO 8450.01 within the board policies and guidelines should be eliminated. I, along with several other parents, including several tonight, have asked for this policy to be eliminated uh, over the past few months. As a reminder, it grants the superintendent the sole authority to make decisions about masking for the entire district uh, in the absence of a, of a public vote. I see no rational reason for this to remain in place. As mentioned, or as, as has been mentioned several times before, COVID poses a similar risk to children as a typical respiratory virus. Now that a vaccine is available, it becomes much more dis difficult to justify this policy. Um, is this level of power really needed to mitigate such a small risk? To my knowledge, this point has not been addressed. Uh, I'd ask for you to vote on whether or not to eliminate this policy. Uh, my second point is actually a short list of questions regarding the future of mandatory masking. Can we expect masks to be mandated at any point in the future now that the vaccines are readily available to all children enrolled in MPS? If so, what sort of lead time can we expect prior to a change in the policy? Given that COVID is very likely to become endemic, 
Uh, when do we expect the school experience to return to normal for our kids? And how important is a normal school experience to this board? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bohais. Mindy Cox. Hello. Um, from the Michigan Associ Association of School Board website, the question is asked, how can a person influence the, the decision a school board makes? An individual can express his or her point of view to the school board through communications and letters to the board. The ultimate indication of support, of course, is a citizen's vote at school elections. In addition, boards often appoint advisory committees to make recommendations about curriculum, school activities, district finances, and building needs. If you are interested in serving on an advisory committee in your district, contact the superintendent's office. However, this school board does not allow any private citizen to be on their four study committees. Further, they restrict any public to be present at these committee meetings. This is completely against the spirit of the Open, Open Meetings Act and the recommendation of the Michigan Association of School Board, which they say gives them guidance and training. You do not get to pick and choose which laws, governing rules, and policies you get to follow. There is a definite need for further transparency and community involvement in the decision-making process of this board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Peggy Hoff. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I was reading something on the website, the, the public school's website, that kind of intrigued me tonight. I have four grandchildren who are in uh, Adams well, no, three of them are in Adams, one of them are in Jefferson. On November 4th, uh, my second grade grandson was uh, called down to the office to get um, the test. Now, they did wait for the parents, uh, my daughter, to show up uh, before they administered that. Uh, I think she did it. Um, he had been in close contact and I think four or five other kids were there. Why they even went to school, I'm not sure, because if you knew this already, you should send them someplace to get tested, but not bring them into the school. But anyway, they did that. Um, so he tested positive. I believe he had it a couple weeks earlier. He had stayed home. He didn't have horrible time, but I do uh, believe the test. The other three siblings, two siblings, were tested at Adams at the behest of my daughter. They tested negative. My uh, Jefferson granddaughter, she's seventh grade, was not tested. I guess they don't do that at Jefferson. That's what I was told anyway. Not one of them had any symptoms. They were called home Thursday. They stayed Thursday, Friday, and the whole next week at home with no symptoms two of which were tested negative. Now, you can say, well, this can be tested positive at any time, right? Because we don't know how this works, I guess. But these kids lost seven days of school. Now, they're all bright kids. I'm not really overly concerned about that. But the fact is, they had no symptoms, and they were tested negative. But this past week, um, and I believe continuing till Thanksgiving, they have to be tested every day. Now that's an expense that I think is silly. They were tested negative. They have no symptoms. Just because a friend of a friend had COVID or was tested positive with or without symptoms, I understand these are siblings, they have to be um, isolated. However, you're paying, we're paying, for testing done every day on three other kids. According to what I saw on the Midland Public School um, website, according to Midland County Isolation and Quarantine Emergency Order, effective October 25th, 21, 
They could be tested. Thank you, Ms. Hoff. Says no masks after 10 days. Thank you. They're still wearing masks. Shelby Huntley. All right, so I just want to know how many of you here are aware um, people that are convicted of child pornography are allowed in your child's school. Are any of you okay with that here? Anybody? I didn't think so. Um, we send our kids to school as a safe place, and they're supposed to trust people that they go to, they are around, but she can't. And I have to explain that to my eight-year-old because it's not safe. Um, someone who is convicted of child pornography should not be allowed to sit and watch children on a daily basis in the parking lot. This is not acceptable. Even if Midland Public Schools has a policy to monitor sex offenders, they do not, while he's waiting in his, in, in his car. Also, <laughs> on 11-11, he came in to my daughter's class for parent-teacher conferences alone, came in alone, left alone while kids were all over the school, no monitor of any type. They also have a camera facing my daughter's room, so you can see him, and I have several witnesses to this event as well. So you're endangering my child as long as well as the other children in the school. I was, t I was told to contact the board, so here I am, by Mr. Sparrow after he was very rude to me on the phone, and I got very upset. You are correct, because this is not a light matter with me, or any parents, I don't think, for that matter. Um, I was, I've gotten no help. I've been taken in circles. I was told to contact the court why he has custody of this child. Even if he does, he does not need to be in the school. He needs to be monitored in the parking lot as well, and he's not. He's been in the school with no supervision. He's been in the parking lot, and he's been convicted of child pornography. He was charged with four counts of child sexually abusive material in Midland County in 2018. He pled guilty to two charges of that. So is that okay? And then proceeded to get a domestic violence on his wife. So it sounds like a Superman that really wants to change. So this policy that you guys, it's not working. It needs to change now because this is some crap. Miss anyone? All right. Thank you to everybody that took time to speak to us. I do appreciate the input. Moving on to item number five, five point one, Administrative Services Study Committee mi minutes from November eighth. Mr. Blazy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We went through a bunch of different updates. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen different policies that we reviewed as a committee. Uh, we went through and what those changes are. Uh, most of them were fairly minor, and uh, we bring those policies uh, to the board uh, for approval. Any other? Minutes, Mr. Lazy, or is that it? Um, I can read the whole thing. The Neola policy updates. The uh, Neola is the firm that the board retains to update our our bylaws. At our November at the November twenty second meeting, Mr. Sherrill will bring for action the Board of Education policy changes to a number of middle and public schools policy as recommended by Neola in the fall 2021 updates 36-1. Neola retains law firms to provide legal reviews of published materials and consults on policy updates in the spring and fall each year, and sometimes more often than that. Therefore, the legal accuracy and compliance of proposed revisions can be unequivocally guaranteed. Mr. Sherrill and the Administration Services Committee members discussed the following board policies that have proposed changes. 
Policy 0100, 144.1, 0152, 0167.3, 0175.1, 3120, 412.04, 5722, 6114, 7242, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 6114, 
and again, John Hatfield as our board member, the composition of this committee does meet our requirements from the Michigan Department of Ed. Thank you, Ms. Miller and Nelson, okay. and thank you to all of our community members for serving on the advisory committee. So now moving on to item number seven. Um, I believe Mr. Lauterbach, you have committee meeting minutes, committee minutes from November 8th, Finance Facilities and Operations Study Committee. Thank you. Uh, the committee met on November 8th of 2021. We discussed the SIS ERP bid. With the assistance of Plant Moran, Middle Public Schools sought bids to replace the current student information and educational resource planning systems. A recommendation is being brought forward tonight uh, at tonight's meeting. With respect to the September financials, no significant year-to-year -year variances were noted. Purchase card and purchase orders above the th bid threshold were discussed. Construction manager contract payments. Per discussion at the October Board of Education meeting, an investigation took place to ascertain if there were delinquent contractor payments. The investigation concluded the following. All trade, all trade contractors were paid in full through the August billing except for one contractor. At the time of the October board meeting, uh, the June, July, and August invoices were unpaid. The vendor, the vendor that had not been paid, was emailed 10 times between June 21st and October 20th regarding compliance holds on their payment because of improper insurance certificates. Barton Mallow's policy is that they will not release the payments without proper documentation. As of October 22nd, the insurance certificates had been provided and all of the holds were then released because the vendor had produced the proper certificates. So the payment was made. With respect to the State Street demolition, administration will be recommending tonight, uh, the, uh, will recommend an award uh, for the demolition contract for the State Street building. Bond funds will be utilized if approved. Herbert Henry Dow High School cafeteria furniture purchase. The administration will recommend the purchase of new cafeteria furniture for Dow High School from Great Lakes Furniture of Holland, Michigan. Food service funds will be utilized for the purchase if approved. The summer tax collection resolution will be read tonight. The board will be asked to approve an annual request to the city of Midland to collect half the school's tax levy, including debt service, during the summer tax collection period. The next FFO meeting will be Monday, December 6th at 5 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Lutterbach. Moving on to item 7.2 for action, Dow High Cafeteria furniture purchases, Mr. Putin. Thank you, Mr. Roush. Uh, per the FFO minutes, um, we have further reviewed the secondary high school furniture. Over the course of the past two years, we have upgraded the furniture at all buildings, with the exception of HH Dow. So we bring to you this evening um, a, a recommendation that we purchase a, an order of furniture from Great Lakes Furniture Supply Incorporated of Holland, Michigan for $165,846.85. They were the low bidder on the project. Food service funds will be utilized for this purchase if approved by the board. Thank you. I entertain a motion for item 7.2. I move adoption of item 7.2, the cafeteria furniture purchase. I'll support. Motion by Mr. Lauterbach, support by Mr. Hatfield. Any discussion? Brian, I, does that help us, it obviously helps us spend down our fund balance in the food service, and then are we sitting in a better position then? No. Yes, sir, we are. Um, and with this purchase, it will put us in a good position. Um, okay. And we're bringing it to you now a little bit earlier than typical because procurement is still a challenge. So we're hoping that that comes in on time. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? And carries. Item 7.3, Mr. Bruton. Thank you, um, Mr. Rush. Well, 7.3 and 7.4 are sort of interrelated, so a general introduction is um, we are bringing forward to you a recommendation in 7.3 for the entering of a contract for a new student information system, and in 7.4, entering a contract for a new enterprise resource planning system, which really is the engine of our finance and human resources department. Um, this 
process that we used for both was similar. We did procure the assistance of Plant Moran, as mentioned in the notes, to assist us with this endeavor because it is extremely complex and um, their expertise helped guide us as our system was last bid in 2001. So it's been almost 20 years since Midland Public has gone through this. So with the assistance of Plant Moran, an RFP was issued and over the course of several months and many, many meetings, vendors were vetted and we are bringing to you tonight for 7.3, our student information system, a recommendation to enter into a contract with EduPoint Synergy as the most qualified provider that fits the needs of the Midland Public Schools for an estimated total over the seven year life of the contract at approximately $945,953 for 7.3. Thank you all. Entertain a motion for item 7.3, SIS system. I'll make a motion that we accept item 7.3 uh, the recommendation to purchase the new SAS software. Support. Motion by Mr. Hatfield, support by Mr. Lauterbach. Any further <laughs> discussion? The Plant Moran portion, I know they were involved in, in both of these. Um, was that a board approved assistance from Plant Moran? Or is that outside of the scope of the board? Service does not request, does not require the board approval for that piece of it. Yes, sir. I don't remember the dollar amount, but it's a service. If you recall, the services don't come forward per law. So the 33, 34,000, whatever the plant Moran was, is that split between these two? No, I think it's for both. It was for both, sir. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, item 7.4. Yes, yes sir. And uh, nearly an identical process was followed for the enterprise resource planning. And just as, again, a reminder, that is the engine that runs both our finance and human resources department. And the history on that is the same as our student information system. It's been decades since we have upgraded that. Again, Plant Moran assisted us in that, and we are entering or we are recommending entering a contract with Tyler Munis as the most qualified provider for the Midland Public Schools needs for an estimated total of $1,266,722 over the um, seven year contract life. Thank you, Brian. Entertain a motion for item 7.4. Move approval of item 7.4 purchase of the ERP SIS software. Support. Motion by Lauterbach, support by Baker. Any further discussion? How did we come up with a, <clears throat> a recommended seven year? How does that come about? There's seven years for both of them. It's been 10 years since we've revisited this. Right. It's so, set, ahead, Brian. Seven years is the new industry standard um, in entering the life of these contracts. That was the recommendation of uh, our advisor plant Moran and that is what we were comfortable in entering that contract term for and as that goes Brad you know the other one was almost two decades for the student system if it's updated and it's serviced and it, all those pieces of it you may continue to do that on a year-to-year -year piece after, beyond that portion of it yeah. and that's what happened in the previous system it became quite antiquated and um, they no longer were supporting it well and so it was time to switch switching is very difficult it would be very difficult for everyone in the district teacher side to the business side as you know switching over banks and stuff that we've gone through it's difficult so you try not to if you don't have to but it's time and these are much better tools than the ones we have okay good questions any other <clears throat> any other discussion all in favor of item 7.4 say aye aye aye, aye. any opposed motion carries Item 7.5 for action bond construction bid. Mr. Roush, before, yep. before Mr. Bruton uh, talks about this, I just want to let the board know I have a substantial 
client relationship with one of the bidders, um, it's a substantial enough. I don't think it's a conflict under our policy because I don't own an interest, but to the extent that I profit from that relationship, I just feel like I should recuse myself from the discussion and voting on this. So okay. I'll, I'll be abstaining. Thank you. Yep. Just go ahead, Mr. Yep. I'll take 745. Thank you, sir. Um, we are recommending tonight approval of bid package 21209, which is the demolition of the State Street building next door. Um, we are recommending that that contract be awarded to the Beer Line <coughs> Companies Incorporated of Midland, Michigan, who was the lowest of 10 bidders at $83,900 for the project. And if this has your approval this evening, it will be funded using Series 2 bond proceeds. Thank you. This time I'll entertain a motion for approval of item 7.5. I move approval of bid package number 21-209 for the bond construction to 483.9 to beer line I, companies. I support. Motion by Baker, support by Hatfield. Any further discussion? They give a time frame? February. Should be done for like, Pretty easy one for beer line. Great price, good company. We made out very well on this. They said they weren't gonna let anyone else do it, so we're very okay. pleased. <laughs> <clears throat> well thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. One abstention. One abstention. Thank you. I've written it down. I All right. already wrote it down on my sheet. Thanks. Item 7.6 for action, summer tax collection, collection authorization. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, sir. This is an annual action required by our Board of Education. Um, this is okay. our request to the city of Midland to collect taxes over two periods, both the summer and the winter collection. We are not authorizing any actual numbers this evening. This is just simply us notifying the city of Midland um, that we would like them to continue collecting taxes over those two time periods. By law, we have to notify them each year before January 1st, and we always schedule it for the November Board of Education to make sure that we have that timely notice. So we ask for your approval of the tax resolution as attached to the agenda so that we can continue with that practice. Thank you. I'll make the motion. I move to approve the resolution for the levy of summer 2022 taxes on property located within the school district and within the city of Midland. A complete copy of the resolution <laughs> shall be attached to the original of these minutes. Support. Support. Motion by Hatfield, support by Baker. Any further discussion? All in favor of item 7.6, summer tax collection authorization, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And as always, a big thank you to our tax taxpayers. Um, item 7.7 .7 for information gifts. Mr. Brutin. Yep, thank you. Um, for information only this evening, we bring to you the knowledge that we have received five gifts for a total of $9,192. And those gifts range from support for student leadership to Kindness Week activities. And all of our donors will be acknowledged in the broadcast credits and also board correspondences. Thank you. And thank you to our very generous community for those gifts. Item eight is human resources. Um, Mr. Jasser for information. Thank you. Uh, first, the below staff member is announced to retirement as of the effective date listed. And this is, uh, this employee is Kayla Pockrant. She's an office professional currently at Jefferson Middle School. Uh, her, re her retirement is effective December 31st, 2021. Yes, please. The board and MPS staff Lastly, 
was a Gary Cooper teacher at my high school. Gary retired in 1976 from 13 years of service. Thank you, Mr. Jaster. Item 9 is correspondence to and from the Board of Education. Item number 9.1 is for information letters to the letters from the Board of Education to the following individuals and organizations as noted in the board agenda packet. Item number 9.2 is for information letters to the Board of Education from the following individuals. Item number 10 is our scheduled activities for information. Um, our next board meeting is on December 20th, 2021 at 7 p.m. in this location. And then the further are items of note um, once approved at our January 10th meeting. Um, and then finally, item number 11 is a study session discussion. 11.1 um, is the Board of Education Officer Nominating Committee. So at this, um, to let everybody know, the seven board members submitted um, their selection for three different people to Megan via Google Forms, and these are the results. The three people on the Officer Nominating Committee will be Scott McFarland, John Lauterbach, and myself. And we will report back at the next meeting for or actually, that'll be the January 10th meeting, right? right. For organizational, organizational meeting. meeting. Yeah. Proposed slide. At this time, do any board members have points of clarification or questions um, at this time? If not, I'll turn it over to Mr. Shero. And I'll be brief as well. Um, I, we did update you on Series 2 budget. That's a question Brad had. Um, you had interest in the dollar amount there. You can see both of very well as we kind of been telling along on, on interest. So we think of uh, business department for chasing that as well as our local banks being very uh, generous in that area. So we're going to be able to do a lot of projects hopefully. And you saw the list of potential projects that will get designed and we'll see if they all come fruition or with all our wishes that we have um, after their bid and we get the bid specs coming forward. So um, the other one is the OSHA ETS as most of us know it's been delayed. Puts us a little bit in limbo because if it ever reverses, there's some really tight timelines there. So as of today, our HR department notified our employees of that potential. And so we've been told to continue to plan just in case it does get changed back the other way, then we're in a good position. So our employees were told them this, w this is what will occur if it goes forward on that December date and then the January date. Um, it's not looking like it probably is, I think, as the picture gets clear, more a little more clear, but we have to plan accordingly to be in the right position if that mandate goes through. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Sharrow, and thanks to our community for coming out tonight. At this time, I'll uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. So moved. No, Support. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you.